Are Americans' views on foreign policy changing, and could that have an effect on this fall's elections? We'll talk about this and much more with AEI resident fellow Michael Barone on this episode of Election Countdown. <laughs> Since the ISIS beheadings, the polls have been showing that Americans are now more hawkish on foreign policy than they have been in recent years. On top of that, President Obama's ratings on handling foreign policy have fallen as well. The latest CBS New York Times poll finds that just 34 percent approve of Obama's handling of foreign policy, while 58 percent disapprove. With us this week to talk about this and to give us his election preview is AEI resident fellow Michael Barone. Michael is a senior political analyst for The Washington Examiner, and he is the co-author of The Almanac of American Politics. Michael, thanks for being here. Nice to be with you. Since we're here to talk about this opinion shift uh, on foreign policy, let's talk about a few states on which uh, foreign policy could make a difference. Um, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, the Democratic voters in these states tend to be more dovish than in other states. Uh, do you think it's possible uh, that in these places Democratic turnout uh, could be down because foreign policy is going to continue to be a hot topic? When you look at the upper Midwest, when you look at Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Dakotas, those are states which have heavily Germanic, uh, American. It's been the most pacifist, isolationist, dovish part of the country for uh, many years. And I think that was an advantage for President Obama in those three states, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, all of which he carried uh, with between 51 and 50 and 54 percent in the last election. I think there's a danger for Democrats that some of their people will be demoralized now that the president has ordered uh, airstrikes in Iraq and Syria. We have troops, we're assured that we don't have troops with boots on the ground, mm -hmm. but uh, it looks like some kind of uh, shoe wear seems to be fairly close. So you've got some serious races there that may be affected uh, right. by this. And, uh, you know, turnout is important in off year elections. Tens most off years to benefit Republicans, their base voters are a little more likely than Democratic base voters to vote. And we've seen in surveys throughout this cycle that Republicans seem to be more motivated to vote than Democrats, right. so far as we can determine right. from let's turn surveys. Back, let's turn back to President Obama for a second, because his ratings on foreign policy have been pretty abysmal these days. Do you think that we've seen the lowest point they're going to get to? And is it possible that he could turn those numbers around before November? Uh, I think that those numbers are subject to change. Go back to President Obama's first term. He did better in ratings on foreign policy than he did on issues generally. When voters were unhappy with the stimulus package or with the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Obamacare as it's often called, uh, his foreign policy ratings were doing well. Uh, they've done more in the second term, and I think part of that is that you see the world in disarray. Russia in Ukraine, perhaps threatening the Baltic states. Uh, Iraq, the Islamic State, the Syrian, uh, more than 100,000 people dying in Syria. Uh, there's a sense that the world's in turmoil. And while voters basically, uh, it, you know, came out positively for the steps President Obama was taking, they're coming out negatively on the results. So could his ratings on foreign policy go down further? Yes, depending on results. Could they also go up? Yes, depending on results. People are going to be looking at the bottom line and not mm -hmm. just on whether they follow, he followed their advice. So President Obama's ratings may not be looking good right now, but neither are the ratings of Senate Democrats. There are seven seats held by Democrats in uh, the states that went for Mitt Romney in 2012. Three of those states look like they'll definitely be Republican pickups, South Dakota, West Virginia, and Montana. In the other four states, the Democratic incumbents are all currently polling around 45 percent, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alaska, North Carolina. So Michael, what's your prediction? Are those, what are these seats, uh, which of these seats is mo most likely to be picked up by the GOP? Well, you mentioned first the South Dakota, West Virginia, Montana. Democratic seats, those are open seats. The incumbents are retiring. That Montana seat, by the way, has never been won by a Republican since popular election of senators came in 100 years ago. Really? That's, uh, Hard that's to believe. right. The West Virginia seat has not gone uh, Republican since the 1950s and so forth. So those are two seats that seem sure to topple. Uh, when you're looking at the other uh, four states that Mitt Romney carried where Democratic incumbents are running for reelection, um, Alaska, Arkansas, uh, and Louisiana, uh, and North Carolina. North Carolina, the Democratic incumbent Kay Hagan seems to be doing a little better 
than her Republican opponent, uh, Speaker of the House Tom Tillis, in, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, that was the closest of these seven states. It was a 50-48 Romney mm -hmm. carry. And it's the only one where the Obama campaign machine did their intensive voter identification and turnout sure, drives. Yeah. Uh, the other seats will be a, a kind of an interesting test because uh, of the relationship between polling and election day results. Because in the past, we had a rule in the polling business, if an incumbent candidate wasn't getting 50% of the votes, they'd probably lose because, you know, nearly 100% of the voters knew them, most of them weren't voting for them, they'd be open to the incumbent. We found in recent years that incumbents polling between 45 and 50% were often winning general elections. In Alaska, Arkansas, and Louisiana, uh, they're polling 45% and under, 41-42% uh, averages in some of the recent polls uh, in those states. So it'll be interesting to see whether Mark Begich can, can get six, eight points higher than he's polling now as an incumbent in Alaska, whether Mark Pryor, who's been trailing Tom Cotton, Republican freshman congressman in Arkansas, can rise from his current level around under 45 percent to get to 50 percent, and whether Mary Landrew in Louisiana, uh, who's won three elections with no more than 52 percent of the vote. They've all been squeakers. Uh, yeah, can get uh, higher than that. That will be an additional uh, perhaps contest that uh, we'll have in December because Louisiana has a yeah, law runoff. that says that uh, in the November election uh, it's between candidates of all parties. You can have multiple candidates, the, you know, multiple Republicans, multiple Democrats. If one candidate gets 50 percent, she or he is elected. If not, the top two, regardless of party, go there. The general expectation is we'll see a Democratic incumbent, Mary Landrieu, probably facing Republican Congressman Bill Cassidy. Bill Cassidy has been leading her in recent polls on the uh, on the runoff, and I would say that uh, uh, I think currently the odds favor the Republican challengers in Alaska, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And if Republicans win those seats, and the three that we mentioned as basically gimme, South Dakota, West Virginia, and Montana, uh, and if they lose no seats, they will have a majority in the Senate. So you think that's still a good bet? Because a lot of prognosticators have throughout this campaign said that, oh yeah, GOP controlled Senate looks like it might uh, be a good bet, but they've kind of been pulling back on that recently. So you'd still say Republicans have, have a good chance. Well, you, you know, you've got uh, a variety of prognosticators that have been looking at each poll as they came in uh, in the week of September 15th. The polls that came in early in the week look kind of good for the Democrats. The polls that came in late in the week look better for the Republicans. Mm -hmm. So people shifted their expectations. I think there's a better than 50 percent chance, and, and that remains the case, that Republicans uh, will win a majority of Senate seats, but it ain't a sure thing. So let's turn to governors now, in particular the governors of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio. Scott Walker, Rick Snyder, and John Kasich are all up for re-election this year, and all are known for taking on uh, labor unions in their respective states. Walker and Snyder are locked in extremely close races, while Kasich appears poised for victory, but in large part because his opponent, Ed Fitzgerald, has been a pretty weak candidate. So one thing I want to know for you, from you, Michael, is how much of a role are these labor union fights playing in these races? And are these signs that it's really difficult to take on the unions and win? Well, the, uh, the three states you mentioned, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, those were all th uh, three states that were carried twice by Barack Obama case of all, all by relatively narrow margins between 50 and 54 percent for Obama in 2012. Their seats were historically labor unions have been very uh, important. I mean I grew up in Michigan and back and you know when Governor Romney was first elected that's George Romney. Not right, Mitt right. Romney. <laughs> 1962 40 percent of the voters in Michigan were in union households. There was either the voter or uh, one other person in the household was a member of a labor union. Those numbers are way down these days, and as nationally, uh, public employee union members outnumber private sector union members. Uh, and Governor Walker, uh, in, in Scott Walker in Wisconsin, uh, and the Republican legislature changed the rules on uh, public employee bargaining units uh, and what they could bargain for. That elicited tremendous controversy. Uh, violence on the part of the labor union supporters. Uh, you had a recall election in which Governor Walker got a point higher than he got when he was elected mm -hmm. in 2010. Right. Big controversy. In Michigan, 
Governor Rick Snyder signed a right to work law. Uh, and as in Wisconsin, we've seen that public employee union membership has gone down when you no longer automatically have the state deducting money that came from the taxpayers and sending it directly to the public employee unions who are bargaining for more money from the taxpayers. Um, that went down, but the public employee unions are fighting back. Both of those races look like close races. Ohio, that is one of the key states in just about any presidential election, it's down to 16 electoral votes, uh, 18 electoral votes, excuse me, these days, but it's still an important state. Uh, John Kasich took on the unions. Uh, the Republican legislature passed uh, legislation that the public employee unions didn't like. They succeeded in overturning that legislation in referendum. Um, the legislature put some other measures in there. Uh, but the Democratic candidate, Ed Fitzgerald, has seemingly disqualified himself. He's the county executive of Cuyahoga County, mm -hmm. the county that includes Cleveland, largest population county in the state. Um, he was found recently by police uh, around 4 a.m. in a parked car with a woman, not his wife. Uh, and it turned out in the investigation of this that he hasn't had a driver's license for something like 10 years. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> it's that, not going to work out well. That's not a fact situation that's very helpful to no. the Fitzgerald campaign. So it looks like that John Kasich uh, is well ahead in that race and will be reelected governor of Ohio. I got to ask you another question about Kasich because, of course, it's never too early to start thinking about 2016. Um, Kasich has been discussed as a potential presidential nominee for the GOP. Now, if he wins re-election, is it a good bet that we're going to be hearing more and more about him? I think we may hear more about John Kasich. Uh, people have talked about Scott Walker in, in Wisconsin as a possible candidate for president. Chris Christie in New Jersey, former Governor Jeb Bush of Florida, Governor Rick Perry of Texas. Um, if Kasich wins by a large margin, with you know some help from his opponent kind of disqualifying himself, uh, in what everybody agrees is a critical state in presidential races, I think that makes him a serious candidate. In addition, he was a member of the House of Representatives for 18 years. As such, he played uh, at least cast votes on foreign policy issues and can be presumed to have some familiarity with them. And he was uh, a uh, chairman of the House Budget Committee. For, for six years after the Republicans won a majority in the House in 1994. So he's had federal as well as state experience. He's from a working class background in the s industrial suburbs of Pittsburgh. You know, they're not going to say that uh, he grew up on the fairway of a country club like no. Mitt Romney. No. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think John Kasich, uh, who's turned 60 in 2012, uh, could be a potential presidential candidate. Okay, let's turn back to 2014 right now, because I want to talk about a couple polls that we've seen recently that have been kind of surprising, both in the Senate race for Ill in Illinois. Um, this is a race between Dick Durbin, a Democratic nominee, second highest ranking Democrat in the Senate, and his opponent, Jim Oberweiss. Uh, there was a poll uh, recently that showed Durbin up seven points, and the Chicago Tribune had another poll out uh, this week that showed a 23-point gap. So uh, what's going on there? Um, is Durbin going to be cruising to an easy victory? Is it not going to be so easy? Well, in a lot of states you have a, a difficult question for pollsters. How many cell phones uh, users do you poll separately? Uh, some Republicans have said in Illinois the key issue is how many dead people uh, <laughs> you poll uh, correctly. That's partisan comment, obviously. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, Illinois has, you know, it, it's a state that has gone heavily Democratic for President Obama, who's from Illinois, born in Hawaii, by the way, <laughs> uh, and uh, in, in the last two presidential elections, it has been more Democratic than not. Uh, but the current Democratic governor, Pat Quinn, won by only one point in <laughs> 2010. Uh, most of the polling has showed the Republican nominee uh, Bronner is is ahead. The Bruce Bronner, Bruce Ronner, excuse me, who is a self-made uh, multimillionaire, uh, and uh, the Chicago Tribune poll that showed Durbin way way up, and that showed uh, Pat Quinn leading uh, Ronner by double digits when all the other polling showed Ronner leading. I think has to be regarded as uh, a dubious outlier. I mean, polling theory tells us that uh, one out of every 20 polls is wrong, and this that poll is a very good candidate uh, for one, to being one of those 20 polls that are wrong. Um, so should we be taking all these polls with a grain of salt these days? Well, I think, you know, polling as an instrument 
uh, was developed pretty well uh, to handle uh, sampling public opinion in a nation uh, where you had universal landline telephones and a population that answered the phone. We no longer live in such a nation. So polling, uh, the pollsters face some serious technical difficulties in trying to get uh, representative samples. You've got uh, completion rates uh, going, that is to say, the number of people who complete the poll as a percentage of those that are called, whose mm -hmm. numbers are called, going down to something like 9%, I think the Pew Research Center yeah. found in 2012. So the question arises, is that a representative sample? And polls, polling theorists will tell you that uh, one thing polls can't tell you is what people who won't be polled think, because you never, you can never, you never get them to answer questions by definition. Yeah, uh, so I think, uh, you know, the, the polling is not an exact science. It's if the election were held today when the election isn't held today, uh, opinions can change. And uh, I think you should think of it as sort of, you know, kind of uh, a wave of steam uh, with some width going wafting out into the universe rather than a single one-dimensional line that tells you exactly where people are today. Polling esteem. I think we're just going to have to leave it on that today. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for watching. If you want us to cover an issue on your state's elections, let us know in the comments. Then please subscribe for all the videos in this series. We'll see you next week.